um, the story of the prodigal child. I think most of you know the basic story. The youngest child, the youngest son asked for the inheritance. He leaves and he wastes it all on worldly living. And then he returns home and, and offers to be a servant in the house. But he's received as a son. And it's a great passage on reconciliation and restoration um, and, and repentance. I could talk about the younger son. Um, that would be beneficial for us to consider how often we would be the same. Selfish, um, waste, blessings. In this case, the inheritance was all gone. And yet God's grace and repentance. And these would be good things for us to talk about. I could talk about the older son. That would be worthy of a whole message. Remember the older son? Uh, that older son had kind of a, an entitlement mentality. Um, he said he was faithful. Um, said that he never transgressed that he was there faithfully not, he didn't even use the word serving, he used the word slaving. I've been slaving for you. And you never once gave me the, the benefit of a blessing to be able to have a big party. By the way, the older son probably refers to the Pharisees. Uh, this would have been their mindset, that they never transgressed, that they always did what was right, and where was their blessing. I want to focus on the father today. And really it's a message for parents um, who might have a prodigal child or might one day have one. And I should tell you up front, um, I have no desire to harm anyone here today. Um, it's not, I, I don't want to open up a wound right, a wound right now and, and irritate it. That's not my desire. But I do feel the need maybe to challenge us this morning. Um, I think a community, we don't necessarily fall into this pattern, but there's a lot of parents who their big desires for their children is happiness and success and independence. And those things really run contrary to God's desires. God's desires are godliness and holiness and the right dependence upon God and an interdependence upon one another. I should tell you a couple disclaimers up front. Parables have their limitations. So to, to take the parable and to talk about the parable itself and make direct application um, could be problematic. In other words, some would say, are you saying, Pastor Steve, every time we find something that is lost, whether it be sheep or a coin or a child, that we should have a celebration? Um, no, I'm not saying that should be the application, although that maybe that would be a good thing to do. And this morning, I'm not going to address the lostness. Um, there would be some who would want to know, is this speaking about an unbeliever who is lost or a wayward believer or a carnal believer? Um, I'll let you grapple with that. That's not really my major concern. I think in both cases... Um, it's necessary to seek uh, repentance and reconciliation. I also should tell you up front, I know enough to know that this is most likely speaking about Israel. Israel who would take the prosperity of God and then waste it and disregard his authority. Um, but by the way, Israel's an example for us, so that's a good thing for us to consider. Um, ultimately, we know this is the Father, speaking of God in this passage. And so some would say, well, why don't we focus on the Lord? Well, we are, um, but I don't think there's a better example than God as being a great parent. Um, so I think there's a lot of things for us to consider. Um, and I struggle, too, with wisdom and my opinion in all this. Will my comments line with Scripture? Um, when you try and take principles or illustration from Scripture, it can be problematic. So basically I'm saying I'm in, a, in over my head in talking about this. And yet I think it's good for us to go there, and I'm going to try and use questions to challenge you as we look at the characteristics of this father. And I think, again, there's application for all of us. I find him to be generous and impartial, wise and patient, compassionate and forgiving, and emotional and joyful. Now, for those of you who are taking notes, I'm curious. I've never done this before, I don't think. How many of you take notes and use the bulletin for taking notes? All right. Wonderful. Good. Well, you'll notice that you're only given the answers to part of the blanks today. I'm saving the last one as a teaser. So you all have to stay awake and really pay attention when we get to that last one. You're going to go, wow, Pastor Steve, that was really great. Uh, but I actually think the last one might be the most important one as we get to it. Um, so let's read the passage. I won't actually read much of it after this. So if you would please stand with me. And I'd like to begin reading Luke 15, verse 11. And I'll read all the way to the end of the chapter. And then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he, that's the father, divided to them his livelihood. 
And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to, to feed swine. And by the way, that would be problematic, wouldn't it? Unclean animals. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this son, this my son, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. And he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I have never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make Mary and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Larry Brooks, would you please pray this morning? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So I'm just going to get right to it. An inheritance in that day would normally be given when a father passed away. There would perhaps be the occasion where he was unable to care for the estate and the inheritance would be doled out. But here the father grants the request early. And um, we're, in a, we're taught here that there are two sons, an older and a younger. The older son would have received two-thirds, two portions, would have been divided into three. He would receive two-thirds, and then the younger would have received one-third. And right away, I think we see the generosity. It was a limited inheritance, but the father gave it to him early. But he not only gave it to him and generously early, even after he returned, the father was very generous. Uh, in verse 22 and 23, listen again to what it says. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. There's, um, and you can look at your own study Bibles. There's a lot of dignity given to this son. All of those things signify very important things in their culture. So this was a very generous, very loving father. And I think he was impartial. Um, in the sense that I, I, I'm using the word fair, he was impartial. This child didn't deserve the inheritance now, and quite honestly, he proved himself unworthy of it in the end, um, after it's said and done, how he, he, how he wasted it. But he received it. When he returned, he didn't get another portion. Um, all that remained was to go to the older son. And I think he was in part um, loving. He could have said no. The father at this point could have said, listen, I got big plans um, I've made a lot of money and I want to take a lot of trips as I grow older. 
or, or he could have said, I want to be very generous. There's a lot of people in need in our community, so I'm going to give a lot away before you all get your inheritance. But uh, very loving, the robe, the ring, sandals, the big heifer, um, and he granted his request. Now, with that being said, um, parents, in case your children come to you today and ask for their inheritance, <laughs> you don't have to grant it early, okay? So children, if you're listening, um, don't bargain that you'll get your inheritance early. But that being said, I think it's important for us to realize that all the resources that we have ultimately don't belong to us. They belong to the Lord. And we're to make good and wise use of them. I think in life, there's a really simple plan for resources. I think number one, give. First and foremost, give your resources to the Lord. Give that first portion. Give it to the local church that God has ordained for ministry. Give. The second thing is live. Um, you got to buy food, and it's okay to spend money on things, and it's okay to enjoy it. Uh, the Bible speaks about if God's blessed you, enjoy those things. But could I tell you, don't spend more than you make. Um, that's a really simple principle. Whatever you Don't spend more than you make, and you'll probably do well financially. Then after that, save. So you give, you live, and you save. And save for a rainy day, save for the future, because you don't know what's going to happen. And then after that, go back to giving. So give, live, save, and give. And give above and beyond as you see opportunities. Go ahead and give and be generous. But in that process, consider your children so that before they ask for money, before a need arises, you'll have already thought through, how am I going to navigate through this? Um, and I would encourage you younger parents to think about doing it on a graduating, a gradual scale of responsibility. As your child gets to that place where they can drive, I think it's reasonable for them to put gas in the tank. I think that's a good thing. And no doubt some of your parents have thought about their insurance. How much do they participate in that? Do they do it fully or in part? Their education comes into play. Um, what about when a child wants a loan? Will you loan them money? And would you follow the Old Testament teaching and doing it without uh, any kind of interest charge to them? These are things to think about. The Rozier Scholarship for our kids going to college was pretty basic. <clears throat> It required that if you're going to receive our help, you went to the local college because it was cheap, the local community college. Then you went to the local university because it was close and you didn't have to live away from home. And we would assist with those things as long as a couple of things took place. Number one, you had to respect us as parents. If you didn't respect us, we didn't want to participate in what you were doing at that level. So that was one of them. Number two, you had to maintain a certain GPA. Depending on the class and your ability, you had to keep a certain grade level. And in the event where you didn't, you had the opportunity to pay for the class. Wasn't that a great blessing? And by the way, get this, if you were also had the opportunity to retake the class, you got to pay for it when you didn't pass it and the retake. What, what good parents are we, you know? You also had to take a foreign language. It could be a foreign language of your choice, either Spanish or Chinese, but you were free to choose whichever one you wanted. My point is plan ahead with your resources and finances so that as a parent you can be generous, impartial, and also loving in the process. But underneath that, I think wisdom and patience are very important. What is not said in this passage I think is significant. This father did not run after this son, nor did he bail the son out when times got tough. Uh, you know, one individual last night came up to me and said, you know, I think there's another piece of wisdom. While this father didn't have to give the inheritance early, this father might have been wise in giving it to him early. Because maybe he had done all that he knew to do with this child, and he thought the best thing was for this child to go out and taste life on his own. And I thought that might be true. We really don't know. But I think there was wisdom that he didn't pursue him, the one who had rejected authority, the one who engaged in worldly living. Now, with that being said, here's where I got a bunch of questions. And again, I'm using them as questions and I hope to challenge you. Parents, just in case, and pray that it doesn't happen. But if your child gets to that place where they desire independence, what will you do? How will you handle it? And you say, that'll never happen in our house. I'll tell you what, just talk to some other parents in our church with some older children, and you'll find out that they never thought it was going to happen either, and it did. What will you do if they desire independence? What will you do, or maybe I should say it this way, what level of immorality will you accept? What if they want to live with someone? 
What if they want to marry an unbeliever? What if they want to be involved with someone of the same gender or someone who's currently married? And not only what would be your participation in that, would you allow them to come to your home and be involved in things that God says is unacceptable and bring that into your house? I could take something as simple, would you allow your child to be at your house and be intoxicated? And how would you navigate through that? Will you fund them if they're engaged in worldly living? Even if it's in part. You know, right now, it's a lot cheaper, isn't it, to be on your parents' phone plan? Parents, would you cut that off if they're living contrary to God's rules and God's laws? Would you help them with insurance and with their education? It's not an obligation for them to get a college degree or even a trade school degree. Would you fund it if they're not seeking the Lord and turn from your authority? This is a challenge that a lot of you have and will face. Will you attend a wedding that God forbids? And, and now i got to throw in another one that didn't used to be there. Social media. If your child is posting things on social media that go contrary to God's ways, will you give them a like? And, and I would even go deeper. You might say, I won't, but what about your friends and family members who are out there liking everything? Would you talk to them and say, please don't like the things that they're doing if they're contrary to God's laws? I'm not suggesting that you can control anybody, and I'm not suggesting that these things will change hearts. What I am saying is that we are challenged with the responsibility as parents to be wise with our children and how we handle things, especially if they go wayward. Um, for those of you who are relatively new to the church and been part of like a newcomer's thing, oftentimes we'll talk about church discipline, and most of you know what that is, right? It's, where, it's not where you take someone before the church and you cast them out. It's actually a loving process whereby you go to them individually, call them to re repentance and righteousness, and if they don't, then take other steps. And, and a lot of churches don't even engage in this. A lot of Christians shy away from it. Because sometimes speaking the truth is a hard thing to do. It has to be done in love, but it needs to be done. So we, we shy away from con things that are, are going to be hard for us, but it, we need to. And I often will say to individuals, if you knew right now with your sober mind that six months from now you are going to be the one who is wayward, what would be the instruction you would give to those around you who love you? Would you tell them, oh, please encourage me. Do everything that you can to help me along my journey to do what is unrighteous. Or would you say to us, please hold me, call me to account. Please don't do anything that encourages me. Now granted, in the day when we would go sideways, we would want everything to be as is. But as we're thinking soberly, wouldn't we want someone to love us enough to not help us with that? And parents also, please, please don't be too quick to dismiss your child's profession. This is, this is something a lot of Christians will do with their children as they get older. Well, they never were really were saved. If your child made a profession, I would encourage you to hold them to that. Don't be so quick to dismiss whether or not they're Christians. Go with me to 2 Corinthians, and I think I actually, I got the wrong chapter. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, so forgive me. I'm grabbing the wrong chapter. I want 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And for those of you who are keeping score, this was my, one of my mistakes this weekend. Also on the bulletin, I put the wrong date on the bulletin. So um, I know it's not last weekend. I know it's this weekend. So please forgive me for my uh, typos this week. Um, but 2 Corinthians chapter 7 most of you know that the church at Corinth was uh, a church that really struggled with worldliness. And, they, and Paul, Paul called them to an account. And he wrote lots of letters to these folks. And um, even to the point where some people said, oh, his letters, he comes off so strong, but in person, he's nothing. So I can only imagine, you know, all, all the letters he wrote, what he must have put in there. But in this particular case, whatever it was, it was a pretty strong message. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and look at verse 8. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 8. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, so it must have been strong, right? I do not regret it. I don't regret the hard language, the truth that you had to receive. And notice he says, though I did regret it. That's what he's saying. I don't regret it, but I did regret it. 
I think he's saying this. Listen, it's hard to do this. And in as much as it caused you pain, I regret it too because it was hard for me. But I ultimately don't regret it. And why is it that he didn't regret it? Continuing on. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice that you were made sorry. But not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss of, from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Isn't that interesting? You can see a lot of people who are sorry, but realize for some of them that's a worldly sorry that sorrow that doesn't lead to repentance. It only leads to further destruction because they're upset they got caught and they have to deal with the consequences. What we desire is a true godly sorrow that leads to repentance, that leads to salvation. And Paul speaks about that, and he says this is what took place. Verse 11, For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. And what was the result? What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things you proved yourself to be clear in this matter. Therefore, although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but that I care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. So here it sounds like Paul's written to them because they're not dealing with an individual who is wayward. And that upset them. And so they were wrong in that capacity. And yet God worked through that to bring about repentance and reconciliation. And by the way, parents, isn't this what we really desire? Don't you desire brokenness and true sorrow and repentance and salvation that is eternal? You know, a lot of times we as parents, we get caught up in what we feel like we need to do. We've got to maintain the relationship. So we've got to keep that up, right? And there's a degree of that which is true, but realize oftentimes your child has already walked away from the relationship. And now it's kind of down to what do they get out of it rather than really enjoying relationship. Now, that being said, I have to be honest with you. When I think about this father, if he were live today, I think he wouldn't be sending text messages to this son. I do. I think he would have done. I also think he would have sent some birthday cards. And I think there might have been enough money in there for a meal, but probably not much more. So I think he would have kept reaching out to him, but he would not have funded the rebellion, nor do I think he would have made demands upon this child. But rather, I think he would have said off, and I love you. Your mother and I are praying for you. And our hope, our desire is that you would return to the Lord and seek him. But I don't think he was pursuing him in the sense to facilitate. But I think he would have pursued him to try and seek out and, and pray and hope that he might return to the Lord. By the way, when that happens, the next phase is really clear, isn't it? There needs to be compassion and forgiveness. Go back again to Luke 15 and look at verse 20 again. Luke 15 and verse 20. I think this language is extremely... Um, uh, it, it's important. I think it's very graphic in the sense that it really wants us to capture the scene here. Verse 20, And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, ran and fell on his neck, and he kissed him. Uh, I like that, don't you? He saw him a great way off, and he had compassion. And isn't it fascinating? He didn't pursue this son, but when the elder son was angry, he did pursue him. He went out to him. And he pleaded with him that he might come and enjoy. See, to me, that shows that wisdom again. One son, it's best to leave him alone. And so the other one, i got to pursue him. But in either way, he has this compassion. He has this forgiving disposition and heart. Uh, the Thursday night class, the parenting book, the author makes a really big point of two things, two lies that our children believe. Number one, they believe the lie of autonomy. And number two, they believe the lie of self-sufficiency. The lie of autonomy, that I'm not accountable to anyone, and right with it, the sister idea, the lie of self-sufficiency, let's see, I do not need anyone. I'm able to do it on our own. Would you agree with me that those are two big lies? If you do, it's probably because you realize in your own self you struggle with those same things. I don't need to be accountable to God, and I can do it on my own. I don't need anybody else. I don't know what the... Um, I don't know what it is that he says. Is it big league or big league? Does anybody know authoritatively what he says? 
Big League. How many of you vote for Big League? If someone can verify it for me, that would be helpful, okay? I don't know what it is. It's either Big League or Big League. In our home, we, Big League or Big League, we had two really big things for our kids growing up. One was respect authority, whatever that authority is. And by the way, if you're not going to respect the authority in the home, we're not going to give you keys to go out and disrespect the authority on the roads. The other thing was integrity. If we couldn't trust you, if your word meant nothing, then that would cause all kinds of big relationship problems. But whether it be the lie of autonomy, the lie of self-sufficiency, a lack of respect for authority, or dishonesty and a lack of integrity, we all struggle with these things. And could I say something on behalf of our Heavenly Father? Aren't you thankful that when you struggle with those things and He brings conviction and you repent, He doesn't beat you up? And parents, I think that we ought to show the same kind of compassion. That if our children get it, okay, then move along. <laughs> Nothing to see here. Don't worry, soon enough they'll blow it again and you'll be able to talk to them again about it. In the meantime, have some compassion. And with that, his emotions are there. He is joyful. The Bible says that what did he do after he saw him and had compassion? He ran to him. And by the way, in context, this would not have taken place in that society. That would be not dignified to run. But this father didn't walk fast. He didn't skip a couple of times. He ran to his son and embraced him and he kissed him. And I think it's important for us to see that this was a celebration not just for dumb sheep and not for a coin that could be flipped, but obviously for a child that has returned. This is a good thing, and there should be parents. If you're stoic, can I encourage you to find some joy in your life? You know, we're talking this year about not just the fear of the Lord, but delighting in the fear of the Lord. And we should be a people who, even on a Sunday morning with our young people, these high schoolers who wow us to laugh a little bit. It's an okay thing to do. And it's okay to cry when your child hurts, to wrap your arms around them, to sit with them, and to cry with them. And it's a good thing to celebrate when there's something we're celebrating. Now, that being said, get ready for the big wow now, the big reveal, okay? So we're going to open up the veils, and there's going to be a brand new house behind us, right? Like you've never seen before. I don't know... I don't know how this initially impacted the father. We're not told about that. For those of you who have been there, I would dare say when that child has left, there's probably confusion. You wonder, how many bad things did I do in raising this child? There's probably a degree of fear. What will be the outcome? You're frustrated. You might be angry. By God's grace, I know I did everything that I could do. You might feel like a failure. I, there's just all kinds of things that could have gone through the process, right? We're not told about that. So don't spend too much time speculating about it. What I would say is in the end, I think we have a clear sight line as to what the father was when the child returned. And in a word, I think he had hope. Because he saw him a long way off. It seems to suggest to us that he's looking he was looking for that child to return. There was a degree of hope. Now, parents, I will confess to you, this might be a category where I don't do too well with hope. And um, sometimes I, it saddens me for my children. Um, because if they tell me the direction they're heading and I think it's in a bad direction, man, I paint a picture that's really bad. If you do this and this is going to happen, then your house is going to burn down and mountains will fall down on you and locusts will show up and you'll get leprosy. I mean, the whole thing of Egypt's going to happen all in one day to you. And I tell my children, I, I'm sorry in part because I've just have seen it too many times with individuals who've received sufficient warnings and they didn't heed it. And I just see how things have progressed and where things have gone. And then if they were to say to me, but what about God? I still have enough stories to say, yes, but God. But God, he is a good God. And so we need to be parents who have hope in a great God. At our old guy get together, our old geezer get together, I don't know what it's actually being called yet, but it's something like that. We talked about this idea of hope this last week, and someone immediately said it is confidence in God. That's what hope is. 
Because God has made promises and we can take that to the bank and Christian hope is not whimsical maybe, it is confidence in God. Now that being said, folks, I want to be careful here. I am not saying that you should have hope or confidence that God will save all of your children. He may not. What I am saying is that you should have hope, you should have confidence that God is able to save. And so as much as today I want to remind us as parents that we need to have hope, we must be a people who pray. We need to pray to a great God who can do above and beyond what we can imagine. And we need to pray, not only for our children, but we need to pray because we need to pray that God would calm us in the process and steady us, that we might reflect the characteristics of our great God, our Heavenly Father, and have hope in Him. Turn with me to one passage, if you would please, Philippians 4. We'll close with this today. Philippians chapter 4, it was fascinating as I planned to, for this message some time ago. I thought about closing out with this passage in Philippians. And wouldn't you know, this week, three different individuals pointed out this passage of Scripture. And I thought that was refreshing, that, that perhaps this would be really a necessary thing for us to conclude with. So Philippians chapter 4. And I, I want you to notice that within embedded in this, is more than just hope for the individual for whom we pray, but there is a blessing from God for us as we pray. Since we're closing with this, let's stand, and I'd like to read Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Philippians 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord when your children are doing great and they're fully obedient. <laughs> Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Just a quick pastoral thought. Every time the Bible speaks about the coming of the Lord, it is always connected to obedience and diligence while we're here. So as you ponder the fact that the Lord is coming, let your gentleness be, gentleness be known and shown to all men. And here's what I want us to see. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, we pray today that you would save our children. You alone can save and God, there is nothing more important that they would know you, that as you spoke, you said that you, that your sheep hear your voice and you know your sheep and they follow you. And we pray, Lord, for our children, the children of community, that they would be your children, that they would be your sheep, that they would be known by you and they would follow you. And Lord, please help us to understand the weightiness of the role that we fulfill that these children ultimately don't belong to us. They are your creation and your children, and you alone must and can save. And we pray to that end that you would use us, that we would show the characteristics that are befitting of you, that we would be generous and impartial, that we would be loving, that we would be wise and patient. Oh, please, give us patience and wisdom from on high that we would be compassionate and forgiving, that we would be those who show the right emotion, that we would be joyful, and Lord, that our hearts would be filled with hope, and we would pray like Elijah, just like us. And we would pray to you a God who is not like us, but able to do all that you desire, all that you will, May it be for the eternal good of our children, we pray today in Jesus' name. Amen.